Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today I have with me in the studio artist Willa Venema. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you, Lisa. I'm really glad to be here. Well, I'm also really glad that you brought this beautiful piece with you. And I've been kind of, um, I don't want to say salivating, that sounds weird, but I've been looking at it ever since you brought it in and uh, just, just gorgeous. Can you tell me about it? Sure. Um, you've already had a couple artists on the show who work with encaustic, Geetlin Vanderskaff and Helen. So they've talked a little bit about it, but I'll just do a reminder for people that might not have heard those shows that encaustic is a wax-based medium. Um, you can use very different waxes, but most artists tend to use beeswax because it's natural. Um, and then a little bit of Damar resin is melted into the wax to harden it a bit because if you've ever had a beeswax candle you can you understand it can get kind of soft and then after that you mix in pigments um, you can get your paint already made um, and some people do that and I tend to do that but um, you can also make it yourself so the exciting thing about encaustic is you're working with a hot molten paint medium. So you have lots of little containers on a, on a hot plate and you have to work quickly pretty much because the minute your brush leaves the paint container, it starts to solidify. So you work really quickly. You can pour it, you can brush it. Um, but what I like is there's just endless opportunity for experimentation. So and I'm a big experimenter. I mean, I think in my older life, I tend to think of myself as an experimenter maker versus necessarily an artist or a painter because um, I just love seeing what new things I can invent. So in this piece, this is a good example of my sort of semi-abstract style where I want to communicate that it's a landscape or a seascape, but I also want it not to be fully representational. I mean, it's really rather hard to do anything quite res representational with the wax because it's very finicky. It will do what it wants. You know, you'll think you want it to go one way and it'll go the other. But in this piece, if, if the audience, I don't know if they can see the upper part, um, there's interesting patterns and those were made from doilies that I embedded in the wax. Then I pulled up then I poured more wax on top and then I scraped it down until you can see the results. So, and then down in the lower half, I used other techniques that I've, you know, experimented with where I sort of become Jackson Pollock and I splatter a bunch of, you know, different colored drops of the paint on, then I layer it. I use a fork to scrape through and sort of mimic, you know, the idea of waves. Um, and then you just keep layering, uh, and until it's right. And the thing I like is I, I don't plan things out. I'm very spontaneous and I work very intuitively. And so the beginning of the painting is always a little scary. And I just say to myself, just put the paint down, just put the paint down. Don't worry about it. And I try to just build up layers and then I take them away if they're not working or paint them over. And uh, I remember you asked, I think it was you that asked an artist, when do you know something's finished? Or maybe another artist brought that up. And for me, basically nothing's finished if it's still in my studio. It's only finished when it's purchased and in somebody else's home. So I will go back to a painting after 10 years. And if I feel like it, you know, it's wasn't one of my best I'll just rework it and redo it and it's that's what I like about the medium so it, it sounds like uh since you're a Portland art gallery artist the the gallery has to pry things out of your hands to move them <laughs> to the Portland art gallery in order to get them out no, the door I mean usually I I have work that I consider finished right and that's the work that I bring to the gallery. But if it comes back and it then sits in my studio for five years or more, I might take it out and revisit it. And maybe, you know, I have, I work in series format. So one of my most popular series was the boat series where I used just a simple um, dory 
boat, which I feel is just, it's symbolic to me. It's not, it could, it's every man's boat, I feel like. Um, and so if I had a, you know, boat painting and I thought, well, maybe that one boat's a little lonely. I'll add another boat in there or, you know, I'll just change things up or rework the colors and just make it fresh again for me. You know, I mean, it doesn't mean it's not a good painting. Somebody might've bought it if it had been shown more, but you know, if it's back in my, my realm, I want to try doing something new with it. So. I mean, that, that makes sense to me. I mean, if it's, it's, it sounds like it's, as we evolve as people, maybe we come back at something with a fresh set of eyes and think, oh, okay, well, it seems like something else belongs here now. Right. Yeah. What's the name of this piece? Well, um, I believe the name of it is Sea and Sky series, but it's very similar to another series I did called Ocean Mist. So it's it sort of is both of those series. I, I, I probably, I think it might say Sea and Sky on the back, but I think I might just change it to Ocean Mist because I have a number of, of pieces in that series that it belongs with those. So. And I think you had mentioned to me that this is, uh, part of a diptych, is that right? It is. So when Kevin, the owner of the gallery, uh, mentioned bringing something in over 40 inches, I looked to see what I had in my studio. And this is part of, you know, there's two panels that are both 48 inches wide. Um, but they can stand alone very easily. Um, so I brought one in. But if somebody needed a really long piece, this would be great. <laughs> Do you find that a lot of people will buy things in series, will buy a diptych versus a, a, a single piece? Um, I've done a lot of diptychs, and a lot of it is practical because I'm a small person and I don't really want to be dealing with canvases I can't manage on my own. So um, this size, 36 by 48, is, is probably, you know, the biggest. So if I want to make a larger piece, I, I will have to make it a diptych. But there is something, or a triptych, there's something just, to me, very satisfying about having these separate panels. It's It adds another dimension to the painting, and it also gives the owner a chance to have a little input, um, because I might think, well, I want to only space those an inch apart. But then the owner might be like, well, for my wall... I'm going to space it four inches apart. And that happened this summer with a painting that my family put in our family cottage. I, I normally tend to space them closely because I see them as a unit, but on the wall that we had them, we're like, oh, they should be like four or five inches apart. And it worked really well. So it just, it gives you some options and it just adds another dimension to the work. This is a heavy painting. Yes. <laughs> and I think that the other encaustics that I've had the opportunity to kind of move about, they are also heavy paintings. So there's, there's a lot more to this than um, if you were to do, I don't know, say a pastel. Well, certainly. And one of the reasons is that when you're working with wax, it has to be on a hard substrate. It can't be on anything that can bend because... First, I want to say that encaustic is one of the, if not the most durable medium out there for art because it's impervious to water. And most art is damaged by water damage and floods. So if a painting was in a flood, it would be fine. But it does have the flaw that it, if it gets knocked hard or you drop it or you bump it, it can get chipped. Um, and that does happen, but I'm happy to say with the way that I work, it's really easy for me to repair a chip. I mean, I basically go in there with a little similar color paint and you just, you know, put it on and melt it in. And because my work is sort of fluid, it, it doesn't, it never shows. So if, a, if anybody were to buy a painting and somehow it wasn't wrapped properly or somehow it got dinged, I'd, I'd fly to their house or go wherever and I'd repair it for them. So, <laughs> But back to you, you asked why it's so heavy. So it's mostly because of the panel. Um, I tend to work thinly with the wax. Dietlin Vanderskaff, on the other hand, puts almost like a quarter inch of wax. So that adds another, you know, several pounds or more probably. But... Um, it's mostly the panel that's causing the weight. What was it that brought you to doing encaustic in the first place? Well, when I was in art school at the Cooper Union in New York City, um, I 
I was taking all sorts of classes, but I kind of was honing in on painting. And I liked oil paints, but I felt impatient with how long they took to dry. And a studio mate of mine was like, well, I've been putting this uh, wax medium into my paints. You know, you should try that. And I tried it and I loved it. So the wax medium, the cold wax medium is... uh, like a buttery consistency and it has some um, additives to make it a little softer so it doesn't harden. And I used that for years and years and I loved it. But then encaustic, as some people might be aware, is having a renaissance and more and more people are finding out about it and taking workshops. And I kept hearing on social media or from other artists about this hot wax thing. And so I tried it probably 15 years or more ago, and I just fell in love because it was just even more versatile than the cold wax, and I never turned back. So You've had an interesting, um, this whole idea of experimentation for you, that seems to be a theme that's woven itself throughout your life. You, you started out playing the flute and yes. going to the school <laughs> that we all know is the school from fame for those of you who are old enough to remember what fame was just so tell me about that how did you go from being a musician and a pretty high level musician to deciding that art was the next step on your journey so um to go back before high school even i went to a small progressive elementary school in the west village in new york city it was really very significant in my development as a human being and probably the reason why I became a preschool teacher along with doing my art. But um, everybody there was exposed to music at a young age and to art and I ended up, first I played the recorder, then I played the cello, then I played the flute and I picked up on the flute pretty quickly um, and I was good and got a lot of praise for it and uh, kept playing it. And um, in New York City, um, there's a lot of specialized high schools. So if you have a talent or you're smart, you definitely apply for those. And I got into the High School of Performing Arts, which is up by uh, Rockefeller Center at the time. And it was actually a small school for New York City high school. It was 400 kids. And You know, I got a great music education, but I never felt that comfortable about performing. It wasn't like my joy to perform. Um, But I ended up going to Oberlin College, which has a conservatory. I wasn't in the conservatory, but I kept up my flute playing. And but then I started taking art history and I was blown away. I just loved looking at all the art. And that led me to taking my first art class, which was a printmaking class. And I really felt like I'd come home when I started making stuff again. I always felt like I loved playing the flute, but it wasn't that creative. You know, you weren't making something new that nobody'd seen before. I mean, maybe if I'd gotten into composing, I would have stuck with music. But um, just the playing the music was wonderful, but the performing wasn't great. And I just didn't feel like it was that creative for me. So once I took the printmaking class and I started taking other classes and I eventually became a combined art history studio art major. And uh, I never looked back after that. I'm really interested by this idea of printmaking because I've heard other artists say that this is how they started. And they don't do it anymore, but that is how they started. Is this a foundational class for art? Because it comes up a lot. Well, there's so many printmaking forms. There's etching, there's lithograph, there's uh, silk screen. And so, you know, if you're in an art department, there'll be a lot of, usually there'll be several offerings. And I was actually intrigued by the printmaking because in the small elementary school I went to, we had letterpress. So I kind of was familiar with that idea. And uh, so I do think a lot of artists, you know, if you go to art school, you're certainly going to be required to take some sort of printmaking. And it's it's very exciting. But again, with the printmaking, I was more interested in doing mono prints where each one is different. Um, most printmaking, you make an image and then you print off multiple copies, which is fine. But for me, it was 
you know, once you've made the original, like it gets a little boring. So you can, with many different types of printmaking, do monoprints where each one is different. You might, with the lithography, you'd, you'd have an image, but then I'd start putting in lots of different collage. Um, so I did quite a bit of that, and then I, but then I started painting, and I just felt like I had the most room to experiment and try new things and be in control of what I was doing. Tell me about how this interest in education um, manifested itself in your own with it, in your own professional career. Well, when I got out of art school, I had no plans <laughs> for how to make any money, <laughs> and I didn't really see myself working in a gallery or going into that kind of field in any way. Um, I didn't see myself in academia. Um, and I looked in the newspaper in New York City, and there was a lot of ads for preschool teachers. And at the time, you know, they weren't requiring a, an education degree, but they loved the fact that I had an arts background and I had my pick of, you know, a bunch of different offers. And I ended up working at Brooklyn Fen School in Brooklyn, and I loved it. And I just immediately knew I'd come home. I loved being with the young kids and just how spontaneous they are, how in the moment they are, and they force you to be totally in the moment. And uh, so I kept doing that. I kept teaching in the mornings, and then I'd have the afternoons to paint, and that continued when I got to San Francisco. And then when I came to Maine, I had a full-time job for a few years, and it was completely exhausting. <laughs> and I realized I couldn't do that. And when I became pregnant with my son, I heard people talk about home family programs where, you know, you can have your own preschool at home. And I thought that might be the right thing for me. And I started one and it was really wonderful because of the intimacy with the kids and the family. I only ever had six kids at the most. And you just get to know the whole family more. And that I found really wonderful. And I kept painting in the afternoons. And slowly as I got older, I hired people to help me and you know, I cut down my days, and then now I'm in my third year of retirement from the preschool and just painting. So. It's fascinating to me always when I hear how young people are when they're first impacted by um, creative um, instruction, let's just say. So this idea that your love of uh, doing things, say playing the flute or being artistic, goes all the way back. Right. Um, and we hear this over and over and over again. And we still haven't, I think, as a, as a culture, gotten to a place where we recognize how important this really is for all children to have access to. Yeah, it's, it's really sad because it's often one of the first things that's cut when the school budget needs to be cut. Um, but there is progress being made. And there, you know, here in Maine, there have been some great programs that have started up. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned before, I was very fortunate that I went to this small little, you know, elementary school, which they were very arts focused. And a lot of the families were artists or actors. And um, it was only till I was an adult and I, I, I've kept up with all of my most of my classmates that I found out that not only our family, but many other families couldn't really afford, afford the tuition there. And they kept going and they almost went broke at a certain point because they were letting so many people go for very little money. Um, but that really had an influence. And of course, my parents, my mother really loved the arts and loved music. And I still remember vividly being in our little downstairs bathroom with my sister and her. And I don't know what we were doing, washing hands, but she's like, well, you know, I've always loved the flute. Would one of you want to play the flute? <laughs> and actually, my older sister was the original artist in the family. And I know you talked to Dietlin about imposter syndrome and all of that. Well, I'm telling you, it's real because since I started out as the flutist and she started out as the artist, you know, I still have a little bit of that, well, maybe I was really the flutist or the musician and I wasn't really meant to be the artist. <laughs> That's interesting. So, yeah. so decades and decades later yeah. that you've been engaging in your yeah. art for this whole amount of time and there's still in the back of your mind yeah. this sort of niggling thought. 
it's, we can't get rid of it. I figure, I mean, I'm almost 60 and it's still there. So I think I just need to embrace it and figure that it's just part of my makeup. But it's good to know other artists to experience that too. So, yeah, I think that's probably true. I mean, I always think about this idea of becoming an adult. Like there's some magical day where right. somebody comes down with a wand and says, ding, you're an adult. <laughs> exactly. And then your whole mind just shifts over and you're magically in a different place. Right. And how really most of us are only ever just kind of evolving iterations of the self that we were when we were very small. Which that also mustn't be interesting for you, having worked with children all of these years. Do you connect back with them as they've gotten older to see what has um, kind of transpired in the intervening years? Well, with some families I do because when I was having my own kids, the families in my program that had similar age kids, several of them became very good friends of mine. So those children I do connect back with, and I do occasionally see families in the neighborhoods where I live, and um, but I don't purposely reach out to, to them because I've got enough kids in my life and families in my life. So... Um, but it is nice to to hear about them and know what's happened with some of them. So, How about your Swans Island connection? Tell me about that. I think many of us have this very romantic view of what it's like to actually spend the summer or any period of time on an island that is not connected to the mainland by a bridge or a causeway. So Swans Island is my muse, and um, I have been going up there my whole entire life, uh, my family found out about it through friends, and uh, we'd make the long, you know, twelve-hour drive or ten-hour drive from New York with four kids in a station wagon, and often many pets: three cats, a dog, gerbils, an iguana. It was crazy. I mean, it was back in the day when you didn't need to wear seatbelts. So we were all like crowded in the back, throwing up because we never went on car rides because we lived in New York. We didn't even own a car; we had to rent a car. So it was quite a journey, but it was magical for all of us. I mean, it was really probably pretty much the only time we left the city. So it was a dramatic contrast. And it's a, it's a rather large island. It has a year-round population of about 300, mostly fishermen and women. And uh, But then it also has a pretty big summer community. And uh, we just... We would rent a boat and we'd go out and visit islands and the the nature was just stunning and I can't get enough of it to this day. And we did have to miss a couple years in my childhood because money was tight. And then when I was in college, I waitressed and was earning money all summer. So I maybe went for a week. And when I became you know, somewhat of an adult, <laughs> I realized that I needed that in my life just for my well-being and my happiness. And so, you know, having a career as a teacher and my husband also became a teacher made it possible for us to take our kids up, not just for one month, but two month, months every summer. And uh, I just love it up there. It's, it's really very special. It's, it's it's kind of a protected space in in many ways, kind of emotionally, psychologically, and physically, really, where you kind of come back to maybe a version of yourself that it's harder to live when you're in the middle of a city, or even when you live in the middle of you know a small city like Portland. I, I agree. It's 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 all about being in nature up there, and Swan's Island. You know, when you're just driving down the roads, it might look a little scruffy with a trailer here, broken down house there. But then when you go down a road that you know is there that leads to a spectacular cobblestone beach that maybe nobody's on, maybe one or two other people. There's some preserved land there through Maine Coast Heritage Trust and you know, very few private signs. Most people are really welcoming to hikers and bikers. So it's just so nourishing. I, I think there's a new term now called forest bathing. And I'm telling you, I'm all about forest bathing. <laughs> I, it's just you walk into the woods and the moss is so incredible and it's really quiet and I also was listening to another podcast that was talking about when you're in the woods, you only talk woods talk. 
So I've been trying to get my friends and family to understand this. We're not going to just be talking about everyday stuff. We're going to be really noticing what we're looking at. We're going to be noticing all the mushrooms, for instance, this year. Everybody in Maine knows it rained a lot, and we've had incredible mushrooms. So even though it might be rainy, um, look at these gorgeous mushrooms. And so I do think of it as a one big meditation, and it's, it is very healing. Is that something that you feel like we are needing now more than ever, given what we've been through as a society and a, and a global society, really, over the last almost two years now? I do. I mean, I feel very lucky that I've been able to access it so easily. And I, anybody that has the opportunity to be out in nature, and it's a safe place to be now, to be outside, I think more people have taken advantage of it. Um, and, you know, obviously, if you live in a big city like New York, it's going to be a lot harder, and it's too bad. Um, but there are places you can still find if you have the wherewithal, the botanic gardens and Central Park. But um, here in Maine, it's why I wanted to live in Maine, because even when I come back to Portland, it's not the same, but it's still easy to find nature wherever you go. And in Portland, there's all these amazing trails through Portland trails. So. That's one of the ways I stayed connected with my friends during COVID is we just go on lots of walks together. So, When I look at this piece that's behind us, there's something about it that just kind of sparkles. I mean, for me, it, it evokes this sense of being on the sea on a sunny day and just that interplay between the sun and the sea. And, you know, you're talking about the very grounded nature of forest bathing and being in the trees. There's something very effervescent, I think, about the piece that you have brought here today and, and about being on the ocean. Yes. <laughs> well, it's interesting because this year I was, I was really loving the forest, but, you know, the ocean is the main thing that really is the attraction for being on an island. It's everywhere you look, it's there. And um, the sun sparkles are my favorite thing. I can, most people need to wear sunglasses. I never wear them. I love looking directly at the sun sparkles on the water. I just find it to be so uh, healing. Again, I keep using that word, but it, it just makes me feel good. It fills me with joy. And so I do have a number of paintings that actually have the sun sparkles in them. This one's more indirect in terms of, you know, you, you have these little splotches of white here and there, like the, the little bits of diamonds that sparkle on the sea. So. It's also interesting to hear you describe the way that encaustic is created and that it's kind of very, there's a lot of motion involved. So you're using motion to work on a subject that is itself motion. So to kind of bring those things together, that's an, that's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, that's a good observation. It is a very physical uh, medium. I, a lot of people don't work this big in encaustic because it's, it's really hard. <laughs> um, you, you're, you know, constantly getting up, getting the wax from your palette and pouring it. Or I use a lot, a palette knife to do a lot of scraping. So I will literally, I don't heat my studio. I, it go, it gets very cold in the winter, but when I turn on my, my palette, that starts to warm it up. And then all my activity of getting up and down and scraping and scraping and using the heat torch. Um, it is, it's incredibly physical. If I spend more than, if I spend four or five hours in the studio, I'm on the couch for the rest of the <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah. In all of this, it's interesting, you know, the theme that I've seen throughout this year of talking to various artists, this idea of um, layering and then Bring, pulling back, you know, there's uh, pu pu pushing things out into the world and then kind of scraping things back to some sense of um, simplicity, I guess. But that's an, for me, I find that so, I guess, interesting because as you've said, then you're always wondering that, that end point, you know, there's, there's so much that you put, put out there, but then how much to take away? Yeah. I, I think that artists, kind of are on a spectrum between starting simple and then building up or throwing everything but the kitchen sink at it and then simplifying it. And I'm of the second category. I tend to start out with a lot 
and then slowly pull it back until it feels right. And and most of it is really just a, a intuitive um, decision making. What your aesthetics are, you know. It was interesting listening to Helen talk about you know, adding something, feeling like it wasn't quite right. I could relate to a lot of what she says. It's, it's, you just have to follow your intuition and, uh, you know, just hope that eventually you'll figure it out. Like right now, since I just came back to my studio, I have about eight or 10 pieces I've started and, you know, I, I know they have to get finished at some point and I'm trying to be gentle with myself and, you know, slowly keep inching towards that finished point. But it does take quite a bit of time to know when it's right. I mean, some, some pieces, they get finished and you're like, that's it. And you know right away, but others, it takes a lot longer. Isn't that kind of life in general? Yeah. <laughs> you never know how much to kind of engage and how much to pull back, how much to kind of get in the middle of things, how much to do and how much to just be. And, and that's always yeah, the it's interesting all balance. It really is. It's finding the balance that works for you. As someone now, you said you're three years out of doing the teaching phase of your life. What, what do you want the next, say, 30 years of your of your life to look like as an artist? Well, I hope I continue to have my health so I can do it. And I think I'm at the age and all my friends are where we're getting aches and pains. So I'm really trying to keep my health at the forefront and stay active and physical. Um, so that's key. And then then I will have the energy to keep making the art. Um, I have found I used to, every summer when the kids were little, I would paint quite a bit on Swan's Island, plein air painting, as several Portland art galleries do as well, artists do. Um, I used acrylic, and my husband was great. He would watch the kids. Um, and I don't do that as much anymore because I really just want to be out in nature. I don't want to be sitting in one space looking at one view. I want to be doing the hike. I want to be climbing up that hill. I want to be walking down that cobblestone beach. So that's a way that I've changed in my grown-up life where it's like I've given myself the permission to not always have to paint and that now Swan's Island time is more about just soaking up as much as I can of the nature there. And then during the cold winter months, I can just sit in my studio and remember where I was and what really caught my attention that summer. And then it comes out in various ways in the paintings in the studio. I remember I once um, had a conversation with the author, uh, Linda Greenlaw, and she described these kind of seasons of the year. So for her in the summer, she was out on the boat and she was doing fishing and she was actively engaged. And then she would do her writing in the in the wintertime. Right. And what you're describing is a similar kind of cyc cyclical nature of, of the art that you create. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I do try to keep my fingers in it a little bit in the summer, and I did do a few acrylic paintings, which felt really good, and one of them is now the basis for a couple encaustic works. Um, but I, I don't push myself as hard as I used to to always have to be painting every day. Like, if I don't paint every day, I'm, I still am an artist, and it's okay. You know, I, I will take it up again when I get back to Portland. So, Are your children involved in any way in art? Um, they appreciate art and I think they both feel like they can make something if they want to. Um, my son's actually a computer scientist <laughs> living out in Seattle. Um, but recently we needed a logo for a Swan's Island organization. I'm, and I asked him if he would make a few and he, so he, he really does like being creative and, and actually writing code is a pretty creative experience if you're doing it. You know, he talks about doing it to make it make it a beautiful code or, you know, easy to read code. And my daughter is still in college and uh, she's dabbled in art here and there and done various things. But I, I don't think that'll be where she ends up. And what's your husband up to these days? So my husband, we met at the Cooper Union, and he was a painter too, um, but he is one of those people that always is has different interests, and he's still teaching. He teaches automotive technology at Westbrook Regional High School, 
And that's incredibly challenging. <laughs> Keeps him on his toes. So in his downtime, he just pursues different interests. And his interest right now is gardening because we just moved to a new house in the historic neighborhood of Stroudwater in Portland. And it's on a big lot and there was only grass there. And he's learning about permaculture and we're planting lots of trees. We're not mowing the grass. I I think our neighbors understand, uh, but so he's all about learning about that right now. But I, I think when he retires, he might end up doing some painting again. So we always come back to that person that we once were, I think. Yeah. Or many of us do. Well, I've really much, um, let me start again because I just smacked the thing. Well, I've very much enjoyed our conversation today and, um, I think I've already said to you a few times, I, I might need to just um, keep this painting forever, convince <laughs> my husband, the owner of the Portland Art Gallery, that we need another piece of art to buy for our house, just say it. Um, but I encourage people to really go into the Portland Art Gallery and experience your art. It's looking online, obviously, that's a good thing because you can get some sense, but when you're in the presence of particularly thinking caustics, I think it makes a big difference to be kind of live and on the scene. I agree. I, they're very sensual works of art, and you need to be there, and you can even touch them if you want to. I give you permission. If you come to the gallery, you can touch my work. <laughs> okay, you heard it from Willa, not from me. <laughs> and you didn't, I don't know how the people at the Portland Art Gallery are going to feel about this, but generally, I've really enjoyed having this conversation with Willa Venema, artist who is represented by the Portland Art Gallery. I encourage you to uh, spend some time getting to know her online, but maybe come to one of our openings um, at the Portland Art Gallery. Willa, thanks so much for coming in and talking to me today. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. It was wonderful.